Since 1983, there's been an average of 70,000 wildfires a year. Fighting those fires is one of the most challenging and vital jobs in the country. Today, with this special holiday edition, we're looking at what it takes, how they happen, and if the government truly understands the profession they're supposed to be helping. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Create Your Own Life show. I'm your host, Jeremy Ryan Slate, the CEO and co-founder of Command Your Brand. And we help to combat cancel culture by placing our clients on the right podcast. You can check us out over at www.commandyourbrand.com. Remember, before we get into today's conversation, to comment on this video, like it, and smash that subscribe button as you you support liberty, freedom, and want to make a better future. Today, we're joined by the author of So You Want to Be a Hot Shot. How Hot Shots Escape into America's Burning Wildlands Will Ignite Transformation in Your Life. Welcome to the show, Scott Mulvaney. Thank you, sir. So, Scott, for people that may not be familiar with you and and what you do, uh, other than being a hot shot, tell us about yourself, man. Well, uh, as the book tells some of the story, I I was a farm kid turned corporate monkey and realized that sucked and decided to give it all up, uh, sell everything I owned, fit my life in a 1999 $3,000 Subaru Outback wagon, go west and go fight wildfires. And in my early 30s, actually, so I was considered the old guy. (laughs) And uh, obviously, fast forward to today, over a decade later, founder of a a charity called Fuel Foundations with the book Benefits. I I founded the Live the Fuel podcast first, which is my podcast that you've now been on a couple of times. And also my own marketing consultancy called Fuel Up Marketing. All three brands, my trifecta, have fire in the branding, in the logo, Mm. because that professional choice, that adventure from hell uh, (laughs) truly transformed my life. And I will always honor it, respect it, and and, uh, share the stories uh, as long as I live. So, so, so let's talk about that. Let's, let's start at the beginning. Like, like how did you get into that? You talk about, you know, (laughs) squeezing into a Subaru and, and like what motivates someone to do that? And then also like, like, like how do you go through the process of doing that? Like, obviously you don't walk out there and start fighting fires. It was all because of a girl, Jeremy. Really? I feel like that's how life works. And no joke, it was. <laughs> I mean, she didn't ask for it. Uh, no, I, so this, I shot her out in the book, this cool chick named Shasta, which if you understand traveling in the West, in California is a mountain called Shasta. So no mm. joke. And it's I, also like a seltzer drink too, isn't it? I believe so, yes. I'm just yeah. not a soda guy, health nut. Um, but Shasta was her name and her sister's name was Denali, which is another mountain in Alaska. So obviously I made the joke before we started just hanging out and having fun together that I was like, Hey, uh, were your parents hippies? Because uh, <laughs> you named your daughters after two different, you know, very impressive mountains. So long story short, I never met a girl from the West coast of the USA and she was so cool. So chill, so laid back. And I'm a guy born in Jersey, you know, and had dreams of working in New York city. So completely different personality types, had a great summer getting to know her, hanging out, and you know, a short-term romance, if you will. And then I was like, well, "Oh, you're going back west?" She's like, "Yeah, I'm going to go be a hotshot." I'm like, "What the hell's a hotshot?" She's like, "It's wildland firefighting." And I'm like, "What's a wildland firefighter?" Because I'm a Jersey boy, I, I don't freaking know. And because it's just not a thing on the East Coast, we have a much higher humidity rate, we have a higher moisture ratio. Wildfires are not a thing. And I had never traveled across the country until 2007 when I knew her. So long story short, once I found out about that, and obviously she she you know went on her merry way, I couldn't get this this career out of my head. I, I became a black hole of research, and mm. I started digging in. So in my free time, I was just constantly looking at, well, what if? Like, what if I, I hate my job? I hate my career. What if? And so I was back in school on nights and weekends at the university, uh, banging out a BS in psychology and marketing, and I was like, nope. I was like, I got to close that chapter. So I kept going. And then in 09, I found an academy in my research out on Long Island that did the basic level certifications for wildland firefighters. And I'm like, okay, I'm a guy with no firefighting background, corporate monkey. I have a very nice resume, but I'm thinking, I used to hire people, fire people, train people, like 30 person teams. You know, I'm a coach in the corporate world. I'm like, I already am thinking ahead, probably overthinking. And I'm like, they're not going to hire me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? So I was like, how do I stack the deck? So I was like, okay, let's go to the Academy. This is while I'm finishing my senior year on nights and weekends on the degree. 
So I cram in a week away in Long Island, do the academy, get the certifications, finish top of my class because they do PT tests. And I'm a bit of a fitness nut and I crushed it. And my instructor was like, dude, uh, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I might become a hotshot. He's like, do you know how hard it is to become a hotshot? And I'm like, uh, apparently very hard. And he said, yeah, it's you're a type one incident response crew. These are the best of the best. And I was like, cool. That's what I want to do. He goes, okay, you're not normal. And I was like, yeah, I hear that a lot. <laughs> so he says, all right, you kicked ass. He's like, if you're serious, he's like, come to Colorado in January. My wife and I'll put you up. You can help me with my fire mitigation business that I do in the wintertime, burning slash piles for customers who have land, you know, to reduce their, their wildfire risk in the off season. Sure. While I teach at the local community college, we're going to have a fire, a second fire academy coming up, and maybe you can get connected. Now I'm a networking mm-hmm. guy, right? I already have the business regime. I'm like, dude, I'm gonna, I'm gonna land something in Colorado. So I pick up everything. I literally quit my job, go to, go to Colorado. I fly in. He puts me up, and I met my future boss. Uh, my superintendent uh, was was teaching a fire ignitions course there. And we interviewed over lunch and he, and my guy goes, Hey, you need to meet Scott. Scott, you got to meet Pat. Pat is an interim superintendent of an Arizona based us forest service hotshot crew. They're rebuilding the crew. So they're not in a very strong position right now. They need reliable people. And I told Pat that you, you have the, the chops. And I was like, thank you. And I won that interview. And he told me, he's like, Scott, you got to give me two years. He's like, I'm literally rebuilding the crew. We have to earn our hotshot status back this year. That's a thing I didn't know was a thing. You, 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 not every hotshot crew is guaranteed to be a hotshot crew. There's certain requirements. And long story short, he gave me a shot. So I came back to Pennsylvania, <laughs> sold off everything at my townhouse, fit the life in the car, and moved west and, and then lived in a double wide in the middle of the mountains of uh, Tonto National Forest in Arizona on a U.S. Forest Service compound and served the next two years of my life at, on an elite hotshot crew. So. So, you know. so I guess what makes, when you say like not every crew ho- qualifies to be a hotshot, like what makes a crew a hotshot versus what makes them not, not so? Yeah. I- interesting side question. We don't talk a lot about that. So there's lots of wild and firefighters. Let, let me at least honor that. I mean, it's mm-hmm. a dangerous profession across the board. Uh, but the common uh, confusion is, oh, are you those dudes who jump out of the plane? Now let's be clear. Those are smoke jumpers. So there's two type one incident response levels of the mm-hmm. federal wildland firefighting regime. Those are hotshots and smoke jumpers. Everybody else is like type two, which are just regular wildland firefighters. And then there's there's engine crews and there's hell attack crews with the helicopters. Then there's air attack with the planes and the red retardant you see being airdropped out of a freaking passenger plane turned into a flying you know, cargo plane type of thing you see on the news. All of those elements are, are essential. But hotshots, we hike everywhere. Mm. It's very rare that we're in a plane or on a hel- helicopter, but because it's so specialized, there's literally last time I checked, there was 105 hotshot crews in the entire country. So yeah. every hotshot crew, you must have 20 minimum, 20 healthy fit individuals to be able to deploy to a fire. So he was literally rebuilding the crew and he was an interim soup. So he was mm-hmm. still finishing some upper level certifications for him to become a true full-time superintendent. So that was actually hurting the crew's credentials. So he didn't have enough credentials to be a fully independent hotshot crew. So they had been knocked down to type two status, meaning they were not going to be called out to the big, the big game, right? The big shit. Mm. Like uh, some people call it, called us like the green berets or whatever of wild and fire. But yeah, like they got to know that you're the best of the best. And if you're not there, meaning not just personnel wise, but credentials and certifications, then you don't get that. So when I showed Mm. up that rookie year, they brought in an interim assistant superintendent besides him to assist him who had those next level certifications for incident response and command infrastructure. And I'm, I'm throwing out federal terminology, but long story short, <laughs> that allowed us to then regain and retest for our hotshot certification. And then in my rookie year, we were able to be going added back into the roster of the ro- the, the nation's rotation of hotshot crews. Cause basically like we, we went live in April but we would stay local to region three, which is Arizona and New Mexico. And that's basically, I picked that because somebody told me that was like the most dangerous sector of the country for wild and fire. So I was like, yes, I want the most dangerous position and the most dangerous area because I'm weird. And uh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, and it's hot. And yes, deserts do burn. Quick side note. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're, you're stuck on your home turf for about the first two months of the season. 
uh, for initial starts, fires, et cetera. And then once the rest of the West basically comes into service, depending on when they start their season, maybe it's March, maybe it's May, maybe it's June, then the whole hotshot roster is established and they just start rotating crews all over the West. So mm. every major forest has to have at least one hotshot crew live and on duty at one time. So sometimes we'll be shipped to California to replace a crew and then a California crew is being shipped to Oregon, right? And they're just rolling and staging until mm -hmm. shit starts blowing up. And then when mm. stuff starts blowing up, then boom, you're assigned to a live fire and you're serving until you time out. Uh, you're only allowed nowadays uh, 14 live fire days in a roll. Back mm. in the day, it was 21. Mm -hmm. And they changed that for, quote, health reasons uh, because they realized that working people 21 days straight, 16 hours a day might burn people out. Well, let, let's talk about that. Like, I guess, I guess in terms of like, I, I guess the thing I'm trying to get a concept of is like, like to me, like you think of a fire station and what it looks like in movies and like, oh, mm -hmm. the guys are sleeping there. The alarm goes off. Somebody slides down the pole and they, they're None jumping on the truck. And it, so, so how does it work when you're a hotshot then? Like, like, do you stay the same place? Do you have a life while you're waiting? Like, what does that look like? And then what's it look like when you're, when you're working? Yes and no. So uh, I served on the Pleasant Valley Interagency Hotshot Crew. Most hotshot crews just call themselves IHCs, a.k.a. Interagency Hotshot Crew, and that's whatever your mm -hmm. branding is. Every sure. hotshot crew has their own logo. Every hotshot crew designs their own belt buckle. You don't get that belt buckle until you've served with the crew for at least two to three years, and then that is your um, – it's gifted to you. You've earned it because it, it goes down into the log of the, like my, the crew I was on was 40 years in existence. Mm, okay. Um, it, so there's, there's a, there's a log of every person who's ever served and every buck, 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 buck will ever given every serial number. That's why I still have it. And I wear it to this day. I'm actually, it's like, it's like, right, a, it's right like a mil it's like a military battalion, basically. Basically. Yeah. Cause pe cause when I came back East, people were like, like I was wearing my belt buckle everywhere. I'm wearing it right now. And they're like, Wait, so you risked your life for two years and all you got was a belt buckle? I was like, all I got was a belt buckle? I'm very proud of my belt buckle, motherfucker. I was like, don't ever question my belt buckle, okay? So, <laughs> but that being said, we were a rare crew because mm -hmm. every wildland firefighter, you have to be within a two-hour callback, meaning mm -hmm. if you have a quote, I'm <clears throat> quoting this day off, which is not really a day off, but it's like, oh, I don't have to possibly work, but mm -hmm. I may work. So there's days off and then there's, your fully released days off. So your regular days off, you have to be within a two hour callback. The problem was our base. We were one of the, one of the re very rare remaining remote hotshot crews. We were in the middle of the Tonto national forest in a Valley called pleasant Valley, which is why we were called pleasant Valley hotshots. And that was the town of young. We nicknamed mm. it the Yungle uh, because there was nothing going on there. And it was really pathetic and boring and i don't understand how they kept the crew going that long in that town as long as it was because the closest town to us was in pace in arizona and you're over two hours north of, of phoenix phoenix everyone knows phoenix scottsdale and you're over two hours almost three hours from flagstaff which is a popular northern city up in the mountains it's kind of like a mini colorado as i call it mm -hmm. uh, but the problem was so if i wanted to go to flagstaff or phoenix i couldn't I can only go on my fully released days off, meaning no chance of callback. Those are your guaranteed days of recovery. But you don't get them until you've served all the way through your live fire assignment days. So there's months where if we didn't have a busy fire season yet, you'd be working all month long. And you mm -hmm. might have a, quote, day off, but you're on base or you'll drive up to Payson to go hang out at Walmart. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really that pathetic um, because you can't go to Phoenix. You can't go to Scottsdale. You can't go to Flagstaff, which are a little bit more robust mm -hmm. cities with options because they were almost three hours away. Mm -hmm. So they had a big hiring issue, even bigger hiring issues nowadays because the pay has not changed and stuff like that. And we'll probably get into that. But it was uh, it was a very hard choice. It mm -hmm. took very mentally strong people to go do that. Mm -hmm. And luckily I was one of those people where I rolled in and checked everything else off out of my life. I was like, dude, yeah. I'm all in. So I was fine. I knew how to prepare for this. Cause I was quote older. I was 30, 31. Most of these people are just like the Marine Corps. You're coming in 18 to 21 was more than half of our crew. Well, it so, seems like it's very experiential, right? Like you, it's almost like you're, you're trying to add something to your life by having this experience in addition to, you know, it's, Oh, it's adrenaline. junkie. Yeah. If you're an adrenaline junkie, this is for you. Uh, it's, 
and I'm, you know, I'm a skydiving, you know, backcountry skiing, rock climbing, crazy nutball. Right. So it's like, this was, yeah. I mean, I, I was so excited to go to do this job and people were here on the East coast were like, what, what are you, what, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You could die. And I was like, yeah, you know, what's the percentage on that? <laughs> so, I, so I guess looking, looking at it then, like the, the thing I'm having trouble wrapping my head around is what does the process of fighting a wild wildland fire look like? Like, and, mm-hmm. and how does it compare to like what people would picture of fighting a fire? Yeah, it, it is completely different, right? So, so when I went to that academy, and by the way, I found out later that uh, academy guys are not welcome. Uh, apparently, oh. I thought I thought stacking the deck in my favor, right? You're like no. highbrow, um, is that the problem? You're, you're drinking, you know, your pink, drinking your pinky out. First of all, don't say the academy a lot. I realized later that was a bad part of my vernacular because I didn't know what else to say because I was new to the fire lingu- linguistics. So I kept referencing stuff that I learned in the academy. They don't want to hear that. Um, <laughs> it's like years ago, I was a bartender, right? And the, the, the place I got into, I was like, hey, I, I went ahead and I, I paid for the bartending school, went through all the training. And they're like, yeah, I don't care. It doesn't matter what they train you. You're going to learn what we're going to teach you, right? So it's one of those type of me- methodologies where, you know, thank you for showing the the you know willingness to commit to a curriculum that you didn't know, but we were going to train you anyway. And whatever they trained you on, we're going to retrain you our way anyway. So basically what I did to stack the deck in my favor didn't really help me. It did show them that I was committed and it helped, I think, open the door. But in the end, whatever I learned was thrown right out the door. Like when mm-hmm. you show up, they're running you through two weeks of two a day PTs, like every morning, every evening of sunset, they're beating the snot out of you for two weeks to, uh, with those days off because no matter if you have newbies coming in, it's to set the bar where you're at. Mm-hmm. If you're experienced or a newbie, it doesn't matter. It's straight out of the military. They're going to break you down. They're going to find out where your limits are at now before we start deploying to fires. So they know if you're weak or strong. And if you were weak, they're going to make you strong. And if you're not, you're going to wash out and they'll replace you. It was kind of very... Now that I think fast forward to today, I'm like, oh, I had a little bit of that Navy SEAL-esque style of methodology because you're not in the cities. Mm. Like when I was at the academy, they started a whole new curriculum called WUI, W-U-I, because the government loves acronyms, just like the corporate world and our podcasting world. We love acronyms too. But uh, it stands for Wildland Urban Interface. Like one of the biggest problems in California is it's not so much, oh my God, global warming. Shut up. It's not global warming. The, the, the earth warms and cools. It's been going on for a millennia. It's you people keep choosing to build your homes deeper into the wildland interface. So that'd be like saying, I don't want to see a raccoon. Well, if you build your house in the woods, you might see a raccoon, a bear, a deer, or other wildlife. So you have to accept these elements. You can't yeah. expect them all to go away. Well, people kept building deeper and deeper into the wildland interface, which increases your home's risk for wildland exposure for fire. Yes. And we're not trained to put your fire ho- your house out. Your house catches on fire. I don't touch that. We're mm-hmm. not trained in structure. We're trained in wildland mm-hmm. structure. People are like, wait a minute. So how do you hike in the mountains with an air mask and an air tank? And I just start laughing. I'm like, what air mask? What air tank? What about all the heavy fire suits? I'm like, what heavy fire suits? Dude, everything you're saying is what you see in your local town and your local city. None of that exists. Mm. And and people are like, well, you're federal government. And (laughs) you can't. It's physically impossible. Like my my lifestyle was 40 to 50 pounds of gear on my back in a pack. And the clothing we wore was made out of something called Nomex, right? So everybody knows wildland firefighters by their yellows and greens. Uh, and when you start the season off, your button down shirt is a yellow material, and then your pants are usually a green or a brown cargo pants. But Nomex is a fire resistant, not fireproof, fire resistant thread. And that's what those products are made out of. You are not fireproof, it is just a fire resistant layer on your exterior that could slow down the chance of being burned alive. Mm. If, that, if that helps you understand. <laughs> so that I'm, I'm answering your question just from a uniform standpoint, because if you deploy to a fire, for example, uh, I, I, I pulled it up here. Wow. Like, yeah, there's not a lot yeah, of protection. Yeah. Like, you know, these guys are dirty as shit and, uh, oh, yeah, 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 they're no not shower. protected at all, man. 
no, no, dude. No, no. Like there's, I, I still have my helmet. I kept my rookie helmet because it was perfect timing. We were cycling the life cycle out on helmets that year. So they let us keep our helmets. So I still have my blue rookie helmet because mm-hmm. they switched to white helmets the next year, but they have what's called a shroud. And I'm, I'm touching my head because it, it Velcros up inside the back edge of your helmet. And it's that yellow Nomex material. So if we're like, what's called going direct. If you're going direct on a fire line, meaning most of the time, we're not putting our face right in the flame. When you go direct, you do. You're going right up on that shit. Like you're 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 going to get like sunburn on your face just from the radiated heat coming off of the fire front cuz you're right up on it. Now granted, wow. that is that is not a fire front that is as tall as a tree. You would never do go direct on that. But if the fire's down to maybe 4 or 5 feet in height, like I could walk through it. Fine. Mm. And people are like you walk through fire? I'm like, yeah. Sometimes you got to jump jump through the fire to get into the black, as it's called. It, right. The area that's already burned is the black. That's where you're safe. The area that's green that you're trying to protect, that's not safe because that could still burn. So if if shit hit the fan, you, you're trained to go to the black. Like mm. you can't burn what's already been burnt. And that's why you see, yeah. If you appreciate the work that we do here and you want to support this show, the biggest way you can do that is by supporting the products that we know, use, and love and that I recommend for you here on the show. The first that I want to talk about is MyPillow, literally one of my favorite products. The MyPillow Classic is what I use every single night. It's handled a lot of my neck pain, a lot of my back pain. As you guys know, I've been a competitive powerlifter since my early 20s. I've retired from that, but I still take pretty good care of myself, and I'm still pulling some heavy weights as I pulled 500 last week on deadlift. And uh, our favorite product from we travel is actually the MyPillow Travel Pillow, and it's one of the things that we actually give to absolutely everybody. It is a great product to fall asleep on. So if you want to go to MyPillow.com slash C-Y-O-L, they have some really great holiday deals over there. You can get up to 66% off of select products. Also, one of the biggest changes in my life over the years has been handling a lot of the parasites in my body. A number of years ago, I did a cleanse with uh, Dr. Jason Dean, and we removed these things called liver fluke from my body. They were actually eating my liver. It was kind of crazy. And every few months, I do either a parasite cleanse or his full moon detox that he's doing right now. So if you want to head over to bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L and uh, grab some of his amazing products over there. I know he has a great holiday special going on right now as well. Support our sponsors. They help the show to continue and they help us to do what we're doing. And we could not do it without you. And you could do it just by uh, using the power of the purse and uh, supporting the products that we love. Thanks. So I guess when you, like, let's say you guys show up at a fire, like, what does that process look like? What do you do first? What do you handle? Like, how do you actually, like, how how do you fight it? Like, what do you do? So that's the cool thing. As a hotshot, sometimes you're the first on scene because if it's a big, if it's a big blow up about to happen and we might be the closest crew there, we are trained and our, our superiors are trained to be their own incident command infrastructure before a quote fire camp can be established, a command center is established. Like when a fire starts ripping off and they realize it's going to go longer than a day, they start bringing in all the gear, right? There's a, a tractor trailer might show up and it transforms into a command center. There's tents being built. There's generators and portable lights being brought into a remote field in the middle of the mountains. And then this farmer's field gets turned into a massive fire camp of, of all these higher ups and they're going to run everything. And there's radio frequencies and then there's catering uh services being brought in to feed the people and all these things but sometimes initially it's one or two hotshot crews rolling in we talk we set up a plan you don't go into a fire without two escape routes established two safety zones established in case shit hits the fan and then you load your gear and you start hiking Mm -hmm. and you find that fire start and you get around it your goal (laughs) is to get if it's if it's small and it's containable we get a fire line around that ASAP. You check in with the local, uh, you know, uh, the local parks or the U.S. Forest Service office or the land management agency that's managing that section of that forest or wherever we're at. And then maybe, maybe it's an area that hasn't burned in a while, and the the spread risk is pretty low. Like we don't, we don't have high relative humidity rates or something like that, like high fire risk. So they may want to let it burn a little bit. They want to mm-hmm. let it like eat up some of the fuel beds, right? Maybe the fuel beds are a little deep and we haven't had a fire in about 10 years. That's dangerous. So you want fire to clean all that up. So sometimes they'll say, hey guys, let's push it out. Let's let it grow to about, you know, maybe a two mile area. So they'll say, hey, okay, now, now we're going to, we're going to basically back out 
and then hand dig our perimeter, our fire line, uh, in a larger surface. So or you guys are like area. digging, digging trenches to start containing. Is that what Basically, you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. Like it's what people, people see on the news and you see all these, uh, on the big fires, right. Especially in California, California has their own air force. They have their Cal fire as it's called Cal fire, which is state funded. It's basically as big as the federal. It's that big because they, wow. they have, it's a huge state, but they have their own air force. They have their own hell attack crews. It's everything. Like, fe- like basically federal is a backup plan for California. Whereas all mm-hmm. the other States in the West federal comes first. Mm. So it's very interesting, but yeah, you, you basically, you have to do it by hand. All of those air airships you see dropping red retardant or water or helicopters dropping big cargo bays of water. That's just to slow down the hot spots. Mm-hmm. Even if you did all that, even if you pounded a fire with water and retardant all day long, by policy, by protocol, a hand line must be established as a perimeter. And that's why when you see on the news, they'll say, hey, the so-and-so fire as of today at the end of 48 hours later is currently at 10% contained. That means we only got 10% hand line around it. Mm-hmm. It means like we're still- Oh, there. you guys are actually like going to the area. You're digging a trench and this seems like that could take like Days, days or weeks, weeks or whatever months to, to, or months yeah. so then how deep and how wide are these things because like i guess what you're doing is trying to make a chasm that the fire can't go over is that the idea basically you're building a fire break all right so a fire break there's actually a lot of science behind this there's a lot of great old school books too like my library i still got a bunch of them the I'm great fall by this by the way i don't know if you can tell yeah. I, uh, it's, it's <laughs> the great the great fires of 1910 uh there's a great book on that that's when wildland firefighting was first figured out or mm-hmm. or just they're like, dude, but back then, dude, I and mean, you think about 1910, dude, back then they would just, they literally, it's in the book. They would go into the local bars when they needed personnel to find the, uh, the forestry guys, the loggers or the railroad workers who are on their days off and say, Hey, you want to make some money? We need to help to put that fire out or else you can't go back and work on that rail line anyway. Cause it's going right. to, you know, it's, it's all, that was the old way of doing things. So, uh, but not much has changed. You still got to give somebody a tool. They still got to hike into the mountains and they still got to dig in the dirt. But before you could dig in the dirt, you also have to cut a, a, a tunnel open, so to speak. Right. So we have saw teams. So that's why I still love wielding chainsaws to this day. Anybody who follows me online knows I'm a chainsaw nut. You can thank your tax dollars uh, because. <laughs> do they, I, do I, they teach you how to stack in a circle too, like you currently do or no? No, that was definitely on my own training. Cause I'm, I, I might be a little OCD. So <laughs> I do have the nicest looking firewood stacks in many miles of here. So yeah, yeah, and, everyone, and, he yeah. actually went on Google earth and showed me a screenshot of how you can see his fire stacks from like space but anyway yeah 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 well yeah. oh, i mean they're eight foot in diameter so i mean they are a, a decent pimple on on the uh the geotagged map or whatever so and yeah i did find a special tarp company that makes the round tarp specifically for the called holzhausen uh which is a european round firewood stacking technique but neither here nor there the point is you have to cut your way in first then start digging because mm. If a fire slams, let's say our, our fire line, if we still have like limbs growing all the way down that tree trunk to the ground, that's called ladder fuel. So now if a fire burns up to that tree and catches those lower limbs on fire, like on a pine tree, well, that's just going to keep going all the way up. Well, if you allow fire to get into a treetop, that is the most dangerous thing ever. Cause now with wind growing, blowing through the tops of the trees, you could send embers for miles. So you want to keep fire mm-hmm. on the ground. So, we have mostly out of a 20 man crew, the first six people are usually the established saw teams. And basically halfway through the rookie year, I was such a hard charger. They quote unquote promoted me, if you will, into a Sawyer position. Cause I'm a whack job that says, Hey, I'll hike with an extra 30 pounds on my shoulder <laughs> besides, besides the backpack and everything else. Sure. Uh, cause I just wanted to wield the chainsaws and be the first guy in. So that sounds uh, immensely so, dangerous though, too, that you're probably having to carry fuel of some sort too. And you're oh, like, yeah, Hey, no, I, you, I, it's on, I, I'm it's combustible. I'm it's combustible. Yeah. I'm yeah. fully combustible. Yeah. That Nomex is not going to help you. Yeah. yeah we literally <laughs> had, uh, this, this, those tall SIG containers you would go camping yeah. with. Yeah. So we had four of those on us, usually a saw team. So there's a Sawyer. And there's a swamper. So that's your team, right? So your, your Sawyer is the first guy cutting that day. And then the swamper is the guy dragging slash for you. So you guys mm-hmm. become very uh, self-aware of each other. Like he'll be up my butt. Like we both got our packs on. I'm wheeled on the saw like all over the place. But he and I have basically built that relationship. So safety, he can come in, 
put his hand on my lower back so I know he's there and he's going to grab that slash that I'm cutting. So that way I don't cut his hand off. This becomes mm-hmm. a very well-established relationship. Um, and you have to become very cohesive because it's all about production and speed and efficiency, but safety, right? Mm. So, so you'll have two to three saw teams going in, cutting and going. So they may give us specifications saying due to the types of fuels and what's around us and the exposure, they might want a 50 foot cut, meaning we have to cut a 50 foot berth Wow. Before we even dig in the dirt, dude, that means everything must be limbed up off the ground. Anything dead or lying on the ground must be chunked up and thrown into what's going to burn or into the green so it doesn't increase the fuel load. Then any trees that are dead, we're dropping them. Then we have to cut them up and get them out of the burn radius as well. So a lot. Of, so the rest of the crew, sometimes they're not even digging yet. They're, we're, we're setting up a chain line and we're handing mm. chunks of tree. And this, spread this seems it, like it'd be fuel out. so much easier with heavy equipment, but I guess the problem you'd run into is you can't get to these places with the heavy <laughs> equipment. Is that correct? And you can't get to them fast. So that's the other thing. Hotshot crews are meant to be fast. We are type one incident response crews. You're getting in there before anybody else. So sometimes if they ever go on for max containment right away, you don't have time to order up a dozer crew and then wait for an 18 wheeler to show up with a big ass, you know, dozer on the back of a flatbed. Then you got to yeah. unload it. Then you got to drive it up there. I mean, it's, it's going to take for hours. So, um, but that does exist. That does happen. So, well, let me, let me, let me ask you this then, Scott, like I'm, I'm curious. Cause like there's once again, this comes from my ignorance. Cause you hear things in the news, you hear things in the media and like, I don't really know it on first Jersey experience. boy, man. I was ignorant until I did it. Well, so, so here's my question. Like you hear in the news and it, I think it also depends on like what news you're listening to, but you talk here that I guess maybe environmental movements in recent years have made this worse because they're not doing as many controlled burns and things like that. Is there truth to that? Like, is this, is this getting harder to do because of, I guess, how we're, we're treating the environment? It's a very polarized subject. Uh, so well, I'm, I'm got, just curious. I've, I've, got, it, like, I've got into it's, very, it's, very healthy debates on this over the years uh, as a guy who I only, again, I only did this for two years. But it was yeah. two years that, that changed my life forever, and I always honor it. So I respect people who choose. I put this in my book. I respect and honor those who continue to do this profession because um, mm-hmm. you can get killed tomorrow by a, a limb falling out of a tree, not even yeah. fire-related. People die every year of what's called a widow maker. A, a piece of the tree snaps off. could be a high wind. It could have been just it's time to fall. Wax you on the head. You didn't have your heads up. Your what's called your, you know, your, you, you got to keep your head on your swivel. Um, mm-hmm. There's a chapter in my book on that, you know, it, but it's like about keeping your, your self-awareness up and mm-hmm. you can die. And, uh, but the point is, especially in the West, there's park, there's pockets of the West to this day that haven't had fire in it in maybe 30 years. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine the fuel load? Like I tell you all the time, picture a pine tree and then the pine needle duff laying on the bottom. Now, pine trees are very volatile because of the sap. So now you let that build up year after year after year. Fire is actually very natural. The the Native Americans did this before we even turned it into a profession. They would clear land to plant their their maize, their corn, their crops. It's all part of history. This is how we did it, to clear land. I mean, Mm -hmm. people complain about it going on down in, uh, you know, South America. Everybody's like burning off the ever, you know, all all that stuff down there, the the rainforest for lumber and everything else. I agree. That's very aggressive. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's for money. Well, I think you can go too far yeah. either way, right? Like you can, you can, you can cut way too much and destroy something, but I think Absolutely. if you don't cut anything, then you can also destroy it. So here, here's, here's a cool piece of this example. Why would mother nature create a tree, which is called the ponderosa pine, which you go anywhere in Colorado, Arizona, Northern New Mexico, the ponderosa pine is a massive pine tree. It is the indigenous species. It belongs there. The, the pine cones obviously have seeds in them. They will not release without fire. So if a tree in a forest cannot release its seeds without fire, wouldn't you think that fire is natural? Mm. Hmm? So That's I, can, really I, could, I, could, I could drop the mic right there. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I learned that, I was like, dude, really? Because ponderosa pine, they're pretty resilient species. So you can have a fire move through. And again, fire is meant to move through quickly. So it can be superheated, ripping through an area. But if it stalls, if it stalls because of fuel load, because no one's allowed fire into that, that's what kills off an entire forest. When you see these burn scars where there's just nothing left alive for miles, that's because in many cases, there was too much fuel load built up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people forget that most wildfires to this day are not humans. 
It's, it's, it's what's called dry lightning. Lightning mm-hmm. is very common. Again, mother nature starts her own fires. That's yeah. why fire is pretty normal. But again, if citizens, very common in California years ago, probably to this day, I build my house and I don't like the smell of smoke. Please stop doing prescribed burns. They go to a local congressperson. They stop prescribed burns. Prescribed burns are scary. Prescribed burns could turn into something bigger. Okay, but just so you what you just triggered for the next 10, 20 years is a fuel load buildup. Mm-hmm. So if there's a spark ever getting into that canyon, ever getting into that remote ravine where all your McMansions are built, you're fucked. Mm-hmm. You ain't stopping that. That's going to rip off. And that's when you see the you see on the news, these things, they look like an atomic bomb blew up. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of times. It's we, we look at what happened in, in Canada this year. I know um, here, in, here in the in the the New York, New Jersey, area, Pennsylvania area. Like, yep. dude, I couldn't see. I couldn't go outside with my kids. I couldn't breathe, and it was I all was mountain biking. Going down. Everybody, everybody's like, you're good. you shouldn't do that. And I'm like, dude, you don't understand that I, I breathe this for like two years straight. I, I, I was running every day, man. So I don't really care. But like, it was like, but it, it was, it was bad. And, and bad. I had heard bad. a lot about in the news, like, well, you know, if we were doing controlled burns and doing these different things, like maybe it wouldn't be this bad. And, you know, once again, yes. I don't know, cause I don't have firsthand experience, but that's what I've heard. You are correct. Yes. When you, when you see fires reach that magnitude, they're, they're uncontrollable. I mean, they basically, they had to let it go. There's no way to stop it. And it was mostly wilderness area, right? So now granted, it was burning hotter than it should have. They haven't had fires up in that area in a while. I can't speak for Canada. Maybe they could have had a better, more established, you know, prescribed burning uh, program. Because here's the problem. You go back a hundred years, we didn't need prescribed burning, right? Or if it did, it was just, we just let it happen naturally. Mm -hmm. We stopped so much prescribed burning that and then you keep, and then, you know, we, we, we breed like rabbits, right? <laughs> There's no shortage of human beings. All right. So we keep growing as a populace. We keep building bigger homes, bigger developments. We keep building deeper into the wildlands and then we stop prescribed burning. It, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Mm-hmm. That's how I look at it. Again, so, again, so how often do you do something like that? What is the size of something like that when you're to prescribe? Like, like how does prescribed that work? Burning can, can happen year round, uh, depending mm-hmm. on the weather. Now, granted, you're not going to do it in the heat of late July going into August, uh, we used it's, to call that out West. We call it dirty dry. August. Very too Yeah, exactly. Dude, the, the chances of, you know, extraneous uh, spillover and, and blow up and everything else into other fires, too risky, right? But mm-hmm. like well, that's what we other- use. Uh, we use uh, firewood as our main heating source. And, uh, Same here. And then, and the wood I'm using this year isn't super well, uh, super well, like, uh, aged, right? Dried out. Yeah, a little wet. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, a, little, it's a little wet. So what I find is we have to get the fire, like, stupid hot so that the wood mm-hmm. catches and it burns normal. So like, yeah. I, I totally get what you're saying. So it's like, yeah. if there's enough water content, you know, even if it's hot, it's not really going to do much. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's where, so more, more often than not, most areas of the country, they're going to do any prescribed burning, right? Uh, spring thaw coming out of winter, perfect time, right? You got all that snow melting off. Like actually when I was out in Colorado for that second Academy, that instructor who put me up a great guy, he, um, he, he's, his business was literally there's these giant slash piles that he, he had done in the off season for these customers that, thin, you know, thin their land, you know, reduce the fire risk. He didn't clear cut the forest, but he took down dead growth. He would thin things out. Maybe some of the trees were too growing too close together. So they're robbing each other for nutrients. Like he's a forestry technician. We were trained yeah. in, in forest health. So he would just thin it out, open it up. So if fire ever did come through there, it could move through quickly. Right, it'll, mm. it'll it'll burn any ground fuels up, but it's not going to get stuck because it's all choked up. Yeah, you don't let prescribed burn coming in there. The forest get choked. Like you should be able to walk through a forest, mm-hmm. not like slam into a wall of all kinds of random growth. That's a sign of thinning needed. My own mm-hmm. my own woods around my house. Past two years, I've been thinning this. My buddy was here today. He goes, "Dude, you've been busy," and I said, "Yeah." Mm-hmm. I was like, I did this for a living. I'm going to make sure, not granted, the chances of wildfire here are minimal, but Mm -hmm. my forest has never been taken care of. So I'm cleaning it up. It helps me source firewood for my own use, but it also opens it up a little bit. I built my own trail just like I did when fighting fire. Basically Mm -hmm. building a fire line is like building a hiking trail, Mm -hmm. only it's designed to secure and contain a wildfire, hopefully contain it unless it blows up. But yeah, prescribed burning is just one way to reduce and mitigate uh, the risks that could become exponentially dangerous. So, well, let me yeah. let me ask you this because I think one of the things that that you brought up to me that I wasn't considering is it's a really dangerous career. You know, it's mm-hmm. a very specialized career actually to to get done. But the the government support 
is terrible. And I, you know, we're spending money on a lot of things outside of fires that you're like, you know, dear God, why are we spending money on experiments to tell us why, you know, frogs can change their gender or some shit like that, <laughs> but we're not spending money on, on like things like this. And, you know, mm -hmm. I guess what, it, what was the, the compensation like, and what is the government support like for a career like this? <laughs> So if I remember correctly, my base pay was around $18 an hour. And right before we started the show, I looked it up for you. And I just, I think this was from like a zip recruiter site because they track all that data. And they said as of December 14th, if you search for just wildland firefighter, the average pay in the country is $17.54 an hour base pay. Mm. You're a federal employee in a job that less than 1% of the world has ever even heard about. Less than 1% of people in the world would ever consider doing because I, my buddy ran the numbers and you're literally, I was, I found out after I did it. Cause my buddy is a geek about that. He ran the numbers and he says, Scott, you're at the time, he says, you're in one of the top three most dangerous jobs in the world. I was like, cool, <laughs> but not everybody responds like that. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, dude, you only live life once. Right. Um, but he was right. I mean, the only, the only way here's the sad part as a hotshot, dude, we were praying for fire. It's the only way we could survive and make money. There's guys on my crew with kids. They're engaged to be married. They're trying to afford a home. All these variables. If that's your base pay, that ain't shit. Mm. $18 an hour? Dude, what are they paying Uber drivers nowadays? What are people getting at McDonald's here in 2023, right? Mm -hmm. And all this year, uh, th thanks to, it's funny because back in the day, I was a social media guy before social media was a thing. And everybody made fun of me because I'd come off these fires. You know, we'd be in the woods for a month. And I download my 35 millimeter camera and do a massive photo dump on Facebook. And then people would just love it. Cause I'd show up every month. There'd be this massive dump of fire photos and, mm -hmm. and people like, and my bosses were like, yeah, we're not into that. Hot shots. Don't talk about what we do. You know, we're on the down low, right? We're, we're, I was like, what are we, a secret organization? It's I mean, come club. on. Yeah, exactly. But now it's every, inst every, every hotshot crew has an Instagram. I'm like, mm. what the hell happened? Well, I found out. So in Arizona the other week, I was out there for a conference and I went and visited my old crew. And uh, the superintendent still is there. He's going to retire soon, my old boss, but he wasn't there that day. But I got to meet one of the new foremen. I was like, dude, what happened with social media? He goes, we're going to do anything we can to try and find people willing to do this job. Wow. Like, so hot shots who never talked about what they did, never bragged about it. We, all, we were trained to be humble and hated social media. They all got into Instagram hoping that the imagery alone would help tell the story and find that rare percentage of the populace that might want to do this crazy job because it is very hard right now to fill these positions because one of mm -hmm. the biggest reasons, you're risking your life for shit pay. Yeah. And it's been that way for decades. The pay has not changed. The biggest thing I saw was a lot, like there's a one feed I call a follow called the hot shot wake up on Instagram and I'll shout them out. And they were posting just last week saying, Hey guys, if this doesn't pass through Congress, they've been, they've been pushing hard to get a revision on this pay infrastructure. And they were talking about cutting funding again. And they're like, so here's a funny thing. We could barely get people to do the job as it is. You cut more pay. Who's going to fight your wildfires for you? The drones, mm -hmm. right? It's like, dude, you can launch an army of drones. You got to have boots on the ground. This is those a hands-on. Those thing. drones are going to melt in the heat too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's. I don't think they're making fire-resistant paneling exactly. light enough, light enough to get a drone anywhere near a fire. And what's it going to do? Like, it's going to have this little small reservoir, and it's going to like piss a little stream of water on it. Like, what are you doing, bro? Like, come on. It's it's. I mean, the technology is coming along, but mm -hmm. you got to have boots on the ground. And yeah. Now, granted, a lot of people I fought fire with. I had guys in my crew from a lot of the tribal nations um, because they don't have a lot of career choices. So I probably had five different native tribes uh, represented on my crew when I served wow. in 2010, 2000. It was a very educational experience. I, I'm honored to have served with, with those people. They taught me so much about you know, what their bloodlines have gone through and, and obviously the histories and what the truth really is going on. But it is true on, on the res, as they say, you know, there, there is a lot of drugs and a lot of problems. Mm. So this was a way for them to say, hey, I don't need my guaranteed government check. Like there was guys in my crew, they did not take that guaranteed government check. They wanted to earn their wage for their family. And I respect that about them. I yeah. mean, it's just amazing people. But then I had ex-cons in my crew. Like here in Jersey, 
if you're being a good boy in jail, you might be get on a litter pickup crew along I-78, right? Like, there you go. Well, I think that's the problem, too. Like, I, I knew a guy, that, you know, this is when I was, like, 19, 20 years old, um, nicest guy ever. Like, he would give you the shirt off his back. But the problem was he was a heroin dealer. Hmm. Went to prison, came back out, cleaned his life up, and nobody would hire him because he was an ex-con. Right. He could not get a job. The guy wanted to work so bad. So he went, back to cool dealing, thing. he went back to dealing heroin because that's what he could do. That's, you know what so, I mean? And I, I, that's the problem. There's no way out. And that's a sad part. In Arizona, it's not heroin. It's uh, what's the other bad one? Um, makes you get like craters in your face. Uh, sorry, I've never, done, I've never done a hard drug in my life. Thank you, meth. Meth is really bad down there. So I have guys on my crew when I served ex-meth dealer, meth user, meth seller. I had three ex-meth dudes that all went to prison, cleaned up their act in jail, got dentures because they lost their teeth. And then because they had a career path, because when they were good and they were hustling, they got to go get on a con crew and mm -hmm. fight wildfire. So instead of picking up litter, you got to serve on con crews. Now, there's only so many con crews. That's not going to backfill to go against this wage issue, but that helped them establish a possible resume and career choice. Mm -hmm. And that was a great way out for some of these guys. So again, I got to meet people of all walks of life. And I, I thought I was the weirdo because I came in with a corporate background and they were like, and they're like, wait, why are you here? Like I was the East coaster. They're like, yeah. you're the, like, why are you here? You're from Jersey. And I was like, I, I want to serve. I want to learn. And yeah, the pay was shit. I left a corporate job making almost six figures at the time at 30 years old. And I was making squat, you mm -hmm. know, but I was there for the experience. I was there to learn. It wasn't about the money, but again, we were hoping for fires because as hotshots, once you're assigned to a fire assignment, you know, in the database, you know, PVIHC is now on such and such fire. Boom. Pay immediately goes to double time, immediately gets hazard pay added on. And we were hoping to fight fire on Easter because then you get your, your holiday pay on top of that. That's when yeah. you start bankrolling because then you have to serve 16, you know, 14 fire days. So we're hoping to get all 14 fire days on one fire because then we get, you know, the overtime because we didn't get a day off. So that's where you start racking the dollars up. Mm -hmm. But the sad part is you need fire to survive. Yeah. Right. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. As a hot shot, I have to wish for a fire. That's messed up. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, Scott, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation, man. People should grab the book. They should check out your podcast. You know, that, where baby. can we do all that? Where can we support you? Where can we find you, man? Well, obviously the podcast, everything is live the You can find the book on there. Uh, the, obviously I'm on Amazon, uh, actually hotshotbook.com will take you directly to the listing on Amazon. Uh, and then obviously again, thank you for listening to the podcast too. But yeah, the book again, I, when I wrote it, I never planned on writing a book and then I decided to launch, to launch a charity to benefit from it. So people can tell I'm not here to make a $1 off of it. If my transformational story can motivate or inspire somebody to do anything else bigger in their life, whether it's a hot shot or otherwise, mm -hmm. that's what I was hoping to get out of this book. And this story was to give back to my fellow man and hopefully motivate people to get outside their comfort zones and, and do something crazy and live their life a little bit. It doesn't have to be a hot shot. It doesn't have to be yeah. wildfire but it is for the, uh, the rare crazies out there. <laughs> well, Scott, Mul Scott Mulvaney, thanks for being here, brother. I appreciate it. For those of you listening, if you have not liked this video, like it, comment it, smash that subscribe button, and uh, help us make a bigger impact. Uh, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.